morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's Walking Through the Word. And I'm so excited that you're here. Before we get started, the first thing I want to do is say congratulations to Gabriel and Esther. I'm so excited about the ministry opportunity that you have with Rachuanya. I might not be saying that correctly. Hospital going in and being able to pray with people and share the gospel. I believe there were six salvations last week to God be all of the glory. At the end of the day, this is what this is all about. It's about being the hands and feet of Jesus and going to people where they are, taking the church to people. The reason why we show up every Saturday is so we can learn, we can grow, we can develop, and then we can go live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what it looks like lived out. So super proud of you guys. I also want to say her happy early birthday to you, Edna. If I'm not mistaken, I think your birthday is next week. Know that we love you. Know that we celebrate you. And we are so, so grateful to, to do life with you. I also want to take a moment and personally thank everyone who has prayed for our family, who sent text messages, the cards, the flowers, the, the love, the food, just to be with our family during this time. It's kind of so many mixed emotions. My grandmother lived to be 103 beautiful years. She was still in sound mind and just the matriarch of our family, but it does not mean that we will not miss her. And there's a natural grieving process that, that goes along with this. So thank you for your patience and your grace with me, especially to our team at Ripple FX. Oh my gosh, you guys have covered me while I have been able to be a granddaughter and I've been able to be a daughter for my family. And those who know me, my first ministry is my family. Always has been and it always will be because one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to have to give an answer for the people he entrusted to my care. Stewardship is so much more than money. Stewardship is assignments. Stewardship is people. And I thank you guys for allowing me to steward what I have needed to do. And also got to give a special shout out to my husband. Eric Spivey is the best thing on this side of heaven in my life. And he has released me this last week to handle business. And he's taking care of every single thing else that he can do. He has freed me up. And for that, Eric, I am so grateful. It takes a mighty man of God to mar be married to a woman like me, first of all. Thank you. Pray for Eric. But also, you give me the freedom to do as the Lord leads. You give me the freedom to be who God has called me to be. And I will not miss this moment right here, right now to, to tell you thank you and to tell you that I love you. And thank you for just covering me. Because as a woman, I am called by God. I'm covered by my husband. And I've gotten credentialed by man in that order. In that order. So again, thank you for that time. Welcome to Walk into the Word. Get your Bible. We're going to be picking up today in Galatians 3. Galatians 2 was a lot last week. Woo! It was a lot. It was like looking at people who had like deer in headlights or just they were blinded by all of that information. I pray you took the time to go back through it and and study it. This isn't a one and done. -er. You know, Galatians is only a few chapters, but it's meaty and it's going to require that we take the time to choose. So we're going to be talking today, Galatians 3, 1 through 25, and we're going to be talking about free in Christ, free in in Christ. Just a quick reminder, Galatians is the charter of Christian freedom. As we're navigating through these chapters, we're going to see how it proclaims the reality of liberty in Christ. It's freedom from the law, freedom from the power of sin, and freedom to serve our Lord. We throw that word freedom around a lot, but we don't really understand it. We sing about it, but we don't understand it. And Gal Galatians is teaching us about it. It's teaching us how to understand it. It's teaching us how to execute it. It's teaching us how to live it. It's not enough to say whom the son is set free. It's free indeed if you are living in shackles. This is about the freedom that was purchased for us through Christ. So the main idea, take a look on your screen. God's covenant with Moses does not contradict his covenant with Abraham, but rather complements it. And both covenants are fulfilled in Christ and his salvation. Everything comes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to the cross. And so a little bit of real talk on our morning walk before we get going. <sighs> Today we have before us one of the most complicated chapters of all of Paul's writing. The most complicated. When you look at verse 20, there are over 300 different interpretations of that verse all by itself. So I got to warn you, today's reading is not for the faint at heart. 
It's not a quick and simple read. It's not a be entertained. It's not a give me a few tips on how to live a good life message from the Bible. It is not. People skip over Galatians 3. They skip over it because they don't want to dig. They don't want to climb. They don't want to do all the things that's required to get the nutrients of it. When you look at chapter three, it should make us think of Psalms 18, 29, where it tells us that our God is able to help us scale a wall. That's what we're going to be doing today. God's going to help us scale this wall as we learn and look at these verses. You know, we're going to see. I think that's a good way to look at it. We're going to look at this chapter today and we're going to see three walls or we we can call them mountain peaks. And what we're going to do is we're going to climb. And when we climb over one, we're going to come back down and climb over the next. And then we're going to end up at that third mountain peak. You know, Galatian takes us on a history lesson through the entire Old Testament. That's what Galatians 3 does. It's rich, it's deep, it's high, it's wide, all at the same time. You will need your Bible today as we literally climb three mountain peaks. Are you ready to climb? I hope if you're in bed, I want to encourage you to roll over. <laughs> this is more than just sit there and listen to kind of, um, you know, just on the, on, in a passive manner. You're going to need to see this. You're going to need to read this. You're going to need to get this because this is bringing the Old Testament together for you. And it's going to climax where? In Jesus. So let's read Galatians 3. 1 through 25, I'm reading from the ESV version. The ESV version. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know that when it is, the, when it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, If you shall of all nations be blessed, so then in you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Then it says the righteous shall live by faith over verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather. The one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Then it says the law and the promise. Verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scriptures imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. 
So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. That's a lot. In that text, we literally climbed three mountain peaks. And the first peak talks that we talk about deals with Abraham. That second peak deals with Moses. And the third peak leads us to Christ. And so we're going to walk through this passage, but we're going to deal with each of these peaks separately so that you can understand the premise and look at them in context. And throughout this text, Paul keeps coming back to these peaks. He keeps coming back to these themes over and over again, but he's coming at them from different angles and he's coming at them from different ways. So if we put it all together, it'll help us better see what's happening in each of these premises when he's talking about Abraham and he's talking about Moses and he's talking about um, talking about Christ. So the first thing that we see is we see Paul talking about God's covenant with Abraham. Write that down. God's covenant with Abraham. This is the first of these three peaks that we come to in this passage. And he's talking about Abraham. I want you to get this. In the Old Testament story, God promised it to show us the, he shows us the necessity of faith, which is his whole theme. It's through the Old Testament, it's through the New Testament. And we're really looking at it right now as we sit in the book of Galatians. I want you to think back to our discussion on justification in chapter two. When Paul explained that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. I need you to continue to, to be a student here. Each of these chapters are building upon the first. So if you didn't read or wasn't with us or chapters one and two, go back and listen to them because each one is building upon the previous premise. So you don't get to forget last week's lesson or the week before that. We're building something here. I want you to think back to that conversation on justification. Now that was in chapter two. And so now we're in chapter three and Paul is defending the doctrine of justification. And he starts out by asking six questions. In the first five verses of this text, he's asking questions. And these questions are really summed up in verse two. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? He asks all these questions, but that one is kind of the center stage. The Galatians here believe they needed to, to recognize that they have, that he's basically telling them, let's go back to the, to the foundation of justification. You need to understand that what you received, you received by faith. You receive this by faith, not by the works of the law. We talked about that, deep dive that last week in chapter two. And so what Paul is doing to demonstrate his, his points in verses one through five, he introduces Abraham. Abraham's name was originally Abram until God changed it in Genesis 17 and five. And then he became the father of God's people in verse six. So you have to know Abram. You have to know the story of Abraham for this to make sense. And this is so important because Abraham was significant for a number of reasons, not least because he was the first man that God commanded to be circumcised. So who better to go back to on this circumcision and uh, this circumcision issue, blah, 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 circumcision issue than the first man God commanded to be circumcised. And that's Genesis 17, 9 through 14. So let's start talking about this. Let's, let's look at this through the lens of justification. So he goes back to Abraham and the first Old Testament text that Paul quotes is relation to Abraham and that he goes back to Genesis 15 and 6. And then Paul quotes from Genesis 12, where God first called him Abraham. I want you to see these pieces coming together. We got to go back to this passage to remember how God's people of faith began to take shape. When you want to know something, go back to the origin. Go back to the beginning. Genesis 12, 1 and 2 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He took us all the way back to Genesis 12. Why? Because we need to understand by grace alone, God blesses his people. By grace alone, God blesses his people. We've talked about by faith alone, by grace alone, and Christ alone. But now we're seeing by grace alone is how God blesses his people. When we look at those verses in Genesis, God promised to bless Abraham before Abraham had done anything to deserve it. His name was Abram because he came from a pagan history. He worshiped other gods, yet God graciously came to him. 
God came to him. Abraham's story reminds us that grace alone came to him. God alone came to him. And it's through that grace, it's through God coming to us that blessings come. So as this story continues, I want you to notice that Abraham did not make a covenant with God. He did not. But God made a covenant with Abraham. This is even clearer in Genesis 15 and 6. You know, go back and look at that. God was promising to bless all nations through Abraham. But at this point, Abraham hadn't done a single thing. He didn't have a single heir. He wasn't deserving of it. He didn't even have an heir. He promised to bring nations from him. And he didn't have a child. You know, Sarah, his wife, was unable to have a child, which is a big problem. I want you to make a note of Genesis 15, 1 through 6. Go back and read that whenever you get a chance because you need to see how this story unfolded. What we see in Genesis is that, is that God is extending grace to Abraham in the form of a very radical promise. This promise seemed impossible. You're going to have nations come for you, come from you, and you don't have a child. This seemed impossible to them. At this time, Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah would be 90 by the time the child arrived in Genesis 17, 17, you don't have to be a mathematician or a genius to realize that these numbers were not working in their favor. The truth is this promise was not about Abraham. This promise was not about Sarah. It was about God. It was about God's grace and God's promises. It wasn't about their bodies. It wasn't about their capacity. It wasn't about them being good enough. This was about God. What God did in Abraham was all about God. When you read Genesis 15, we read about the covenant God made with Abraham. And this is so ironic. I missed this for years and I'll never forget my pastor, Pastor Lee Stokes, who taught this when I got it. He talked about how God cut up on covenant with Abraham, how Abraham was asleep. He had to put him to sleep so that he could have no part in doing this. It needed to be 100% God, not man. Abraham didn't have to sacrifice an animal. He didn't have to do a ritual. He didn't have to bring an offering. He was sleep. It was totally God and totally God's grace. It wasn't Abraham's works. And when you read out Genesis 15, he was sleep. He was sleep. He was only the conduit. He didn't do it. So when you think about this covenant being cut, it wasn't based on Abraham's works. It wasn't based on Abraham's sacrifice. It wasn't based on Abraham's goodness. It wasn't. It was all based on God. So Abraham's righteousness, look at Genesis 15, 6. I want you to see that. It was credited to him. It was credited to, it to him. It was given to him by grace alone. Literally, credit means it was added to his account. Why? By grace alone, because God blesses his people. So the question comes up, how did Abraham receive this blessing? If he didn't do anything, how did he receive it? The answer is through faith alone, God's people receive his blessing. Through faith alone, God's people receive his blessing. You know, grace isn't earned. Abraham simply believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't do anything. He believed something. Let me say that again. He didn't do anything. He believed something. Even more important than him believing something is he believed someone. He believed God. In Galatians 3, Paul addresses the relationship of Abraham's righteousness to the, his circumcision in Romans 4, 9 through 12. I told you, you can't forget these lessons. They keep building upon themselves. This is a passage that literally serves as commentary for Galatians 3. Write that down, Romans 4, 9 and 12. It's backdrop. It's a backdrop. The, uh, the apostle asks, Paul says, in what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised. This is a big deal. Because Abraham was declared righteous. Get this. Before he was circumcised. Paul is bringing this conversation to the scene. Because Paul. Excuse me. Because Abraham was declared righteous. Before he was circumcised. The crucial point was not circumcision. The crucial point in what happened with Abraham was faith. Write that down. Put it in the chat. Put it in your notes. Faith. Let me know you're out there. Faith. The key word here is faith. It wasn't circumcision. It was faith. Faith is the key word here. 
faith and faith alone. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Believe God and it's credited to you as righteousness. So the question comes up again. If that's all, doesn't that lead to to loose living? If all I got to do is receive this and believe this, then I can live any old kind of way. No, the answer is no. We become righteous before God through faith in Christ. And this faith is expressed in radical obedience. The fruit of this faith is obedience. We become righteous before God through faith in Christ. And this faith is expressed in radical obedience. It's not enough to say you got faith. You got to express faith. And what does faith look like express? It looks like obedience. Think back to Abraham. What happened after his faith was credited to him for righteousness? Then he was circumcised. Get that. He believed God. He believed God. He had faith. When he, then that faith was credited to him as righteousness. And then he was righteous before God. And then he was obedient. He obeyed because of his faith. The fruit of our faith should be obedience. He was justified by faith, but he also began to live obediently by faith. It's not enough to be justified by faith. We need to live by faith. Go back and listen to chapter two. We're not alive to ourselves. We're dead to ourselves. We're alive in Christ. Christ lives in us. That faith should be expressed through us. Just a quick recap, because that's a big mountain peak. Woo, and I done got excited. We just looked at God's covenant with Abraham. So then Paul moves on to some more Old Testament history. And this time he's moving on to Moses. It's important to remember that God's covenant with Moses does not contradict his covenant with Abraham. Paul says in Galatians 3, 15 through 16, take a look at it. Take a look at it. He says that the law gave, gave through Moses didn't nullify or replace what had been promised to and through Abraham. Abraham, it complemented it by serving that promise. Look at the verses, 15 through 16. You know, the Judaizers who he's talking to, they recognize the importance of the Abrahamic covenant, but they gave priority to the Mosaic covenant. They put priority on Moses. They said, okay, we can do Moses. This Abraham piece, Moses, yeah, Abraham, yeah, but Moses, oh yeah. That's kind of how they thought. So instead of looking at the Mosaic covenant through the lens of the Abrahamic covenant, they reversed the order. The Judaizers viewed the Abrahamic covenant through the lens of the Mosaic covenant, which led them to emphasize Moses' obedience to the law as primary. So they reasoned that to be right with God, you got to do certain things. The way they viewed this, to be right with God, you have to do stuff. That's what they believe. If I'm going to be right, I got to do, I got to do. It's what I can control. It's what I can, what I can handle, what I can earn, what I can deserve, what I can merit. But that was not true. You know, Paul is teaching them that the necessity of faith is not in one covenant. It's in both covenants. The foundation for both is faith. God saves his people by grace through faith, even under the law in the Old Testament, Old, Old Testament. And this aspect of salvation has never changed. So if that's the case, if that's the case, why did God give the law? So this is what Paul addresses in Galatians 3, 10 through 25. We're getting to that place where he's now taking us on another mountain. And we're looking at God's covenant with Moses. God's covenant with Moses. The key to understanding God's covenant with Moses is proper understanding of the purpose of the law in the first place. One way to look at this is that God's law shows us the futility. It shows us the vainness, the ineffectiveness of the flesh. And to make sure we're clear and on the same page, most of Paul's references to the law, including here in Galatians 3, deal with the commandments and the requirements God gave to his people through Moses. These are moral laws. Think back to the Ten Commandments. Then there are ceremonial laws about how to worship, which sacrifices to make, which foods to eat, which festivals to celebrate. Then there were civil laws, which outlined procedures and punishments for crimes like murder and adultery. You know, Eric and I are reading through the Bible, and we're going through all of the, the um, 
the cities of refuge and we're going through all the things what happens if you murder someone and it's a lot but this is all laid out through those civil laws in the old testament so they're moral they're ceremonial and they're civil laws and they all came together to form what these judaizers knew as the law and this is important for understanding galatians 3 because when the law is mentioned paul is specifically talking about the old testament law revealed to moses that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about all of scripture. He's not talking about the whole Bible, including the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures according to Moses. So he starts out, look at verse 10. He starts out talking about the law. We see that right there in verse 10. He begins by talking about what the law cannot do. It cannot bring life. It cannot bring salvation. So then look down to verse 19. It talks about how it can't bring righteousness before God. So then he gets to the obvious question. Look at it. Why then was the law given? In other words, if it cannot do these things, what's the point? So Paul answers this question by telling us that the law was given to show us that we are weak, that we're futile, and that we are unable in our flesh. We are not able in our flesh to, to truly honor God. So he's teaching that. So Paul refers to the flesh here. He, we, we're going to talk about the flesh in other places in Galatians. And when he talks about that flesh, he's normally referring to the sinful nature in us. This is that nature in us apart from Christ. The flesh says, listen, I am the authority in my life. I call the shots. I know what's best. I do what I want to do. Don't tell me anything different. I'm the boss of this thing. That's what our flesh says inside of us. You know, this is the same mindset. This isn't new, y'all. This is the same mindset that Adam and Eve took in the Garden of Eden in the very beginning. I can eat this fruit if I want to. If I want this, I can have this. So Paul is saying that the law was given to clarify that the flesh is sinful to the core and is in desperate need of salvation. The law shows us a few things that we need to know and some things that we, we don't see in of ourselves. It, it shows us our weaknesses, it shows us our selfishness, it shows us our, uh, you name it, pride, ego. It shows us the those parts of us that gotta, that's got to die. The law shows us that in and of ourselves, there's no good thing. There's nothing good in us apart from Jesus. So what it shows us, let's look at this. Number one, we all disobey the law of God. Number one, we all disobey the law of God. You know, in our flesh, we disobey God. This is what Paul is saying in Galatians 3 and 10. Look at it. Take a look at it. For all who rely on works of the law are under curse. For it is written, curse be everyone who does not buy by all things written in the book of the law and do them. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 27, 26. And he's, he's showing that the law demands obedience. More specifically, perfect obedience. Something we can't do. We're not capable of doing. You know, Jesus says during his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 and 48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. There is no perfection in us. The law shows us we cannot be perfect. The law exposes our sin. I want to be clear here. The law doesn't make us sinners. It reveals the fact that we're already sinners. It uncovers our sinful hearts. You know, giving instructions to children is a really good example of how the law works and what the purpose of the law was. Your child has a sinful heart, but it's not until you say do this and they don't do it that you're able to see the sin in his heart on display. It's in there until you say don't do this and they do it. You don't get to see on display what's in them. The law brings sin to the surface. It brings it to the surface and it shines a light on it. You know, the command to do something brings about, brings disobedient hearts to the surface. Just like that happens in a child, the law of God exposes the sinful heart in each of us. The law brings it to the surface. <laughs> and the reality is not only does it expose our sin, it also intensifies our sin. Look at Galatians 3.19. Look at 3.19. Paul says that the law was added because of transgressions. Because of transgressions, it shows us the, the level of passion. It shows us the, the level of disobedience here. There are tons of different views on this verse. One translation says to produce translations, which is what lines up with what Paul said in Romans 5.20. The law came along to multiply the trespass. The law isn't sinful. The law is good. Romans 7.12 says that it is just and good. 
But what the law does is it confronts us with our own disobedience. It confronts us with our own continual disobedience. The law exposes our sin. The law should push us into the arms of Jesus. The law should make us lay down at the feet of Jesus. The law should make us cry out for mercy from Jesus. The law should make us cry. It should make us see ourselves. Why? Because the answer is this. Number two, why should we cry out? We all deserve the wrath of God. We all deserve the wrath of God. The result of our sin and our disobedience is that we all deserve the wrath of God. What is wrath? It's anger, it's rage, it's fury, it's madness. It's not good to be confronted by sin in the presence of a holy God. A God who has no sin and is who, who's holy dead set against sin. It's not good for us to come to God with that. The law causes us to tremble before God because of the wrath of God. We, we can't come to God with that. We can't come before a holy God dirty and sinful and prideful and lustful. We can't do that. Martin Luther said this. The principal point of the law is to make men not better but worse. That is to say, it showeth unto them their sin, that by the knowledge, therefore, they may be humbled, terrified, bruised and broken and by this means may be driven to seek grace the law should drive us into the grace of jesus christ we need grace paul says because we stand crushed beneath the law we cannot stand against the law verse 10 look at it makes though this point concerning those who rely on the works of the law clear look at verse 10 it's so important that we understand God's covenant with Moses. You know, the prior covenant made with Abraham was focused on blessing. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and all of the people of the earth will be blessed through you. But the setting is different when we get to the covenant that God made through Moses. Deuteronomy 27 is where we get our, our reference here. This is what Paul is talking about when we look at Galatians 3.10. You know, when we in Deuteronomy, Moses tells the people of God to divide up between two mountains, face each, face each other, shout to one another. One group pronounces blessings on the group and the other group is to pronounce curses. What you need to see, Deuteronomy 27, 15, 15 through 26, if you want to see this. The curse fell on the ground of those who disobeyed their fathers and mothers, those who led the blind astray and on those who committed different sins. So those who didn't honor the law, those who sinned, the curse fell on them. And so after they after they did this, the people were to shout amen. There was blessings with this covenant and there were curses with this covenant. One side was going to win. One side was going to lose. When you look at Deuteronomy 27 and 26. This is where Paul is quoting in Galatians 3 and 10, that the curse lies on those who do not obey the law. The curse lies on those who don't obey the law. So the law was given to remind us that we are cursed under the judgment of God because we fail to do everything where? Written in the book of the law. We cannot make our own way to God. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't merit it. It's not possible. I want you to think about Galatians 3. Look at it. It's pronouncing a curse on all people, including those who are trying to obey the law of God. Because nobody can obey it perfectly. That word perfectly matters. Because you can try in your own power, but you won't. You're going to fail. And even if you do a little bit, you're not going to do it perfectly. The law shows every single one of us that we are cursed beneath it. And as a result, we stand condemned before God. The Westminster Catechism says, Catechism says, what does every sin deserve? The answer is every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. What does every sin deserve? Wrath and the curse, both in this life and that which is to come. And this answer is not popular. But it's true. Every single one of us stands guilty before God's law. And the more you try to obey it, the more you go to church, the more you try to pray, the more you try to be good, the more to try, you try to lead your family the right way, the more the law says guilty. The more you try to be right, the more you try in your own power, every time the law is going to say guilty, guilty of sin. Because you tried, but you didn't do enough. You 
you did the best you could, but it still wasn't enough. Every time we come up against the law, it's going to say guilty. And that should make us feel helpless. Like you can't ever get it. Helpless, like you're on this vicious cycle of trying. It's exhausting. Guess what? This is the point. This is why God gave the law to show us we can't get it right. That my, that is the reason we need the law. We can't get it right in of ourselves. We can't do enough good in ourselves. I don't care how hard we try. I don't care how holy we try to be. We can't get this right in and of ourselves. It's why we can't shrink back from talking about words like curse and condemnation, wrath, disobedience, weakness, holiness, and accountability. You know, that's why we can't afford to not talk about these words. If nobody's talking about them, we think we're okay, but we're not. We think we're doing good. We're not. We're not. We're desperately in need of a savior to deliver us from the curse and the condemnation and the wrath that is due our disobedience and our rebellion of our flesh. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how hard you try. The answer from the law is guilty, which is why we need grace. Paul says in verse 22, look at it, that we are prisoners of sin because of the law. Locked up with no way out, chained with no hope of breaking free in our own strength. Look at verse 22. That's my remix. But that's what Paul is saying. You're shackled to this thing. You're shackled to this thing. Look at verse 23 and 24. It says it this way. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian when? Until... Until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. There was a reason. There was a time on that thing. Okay, let me give a recap. Let me give a recap. Okay, hold on. I want to make sure all on the same page. Same page. Take a seat on the park bench. I know we're walking. I'm moving a little bit fast, but this is good. You know, so far we looked at the first mountain peak of God's covenant with Abraham, where God promises and shows us the necessary and necessity of faith. The second mountain peak came in the covenant with Moses where the law shows us the futility of the flesh. Now the third mountain peak, get ready. This is the most impressive of all. This has the most amazing view ever. It is God's covenant through Christ. It's God's covenant with Jesus. What you need to know is all this law we've been talking about, Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. Notice that word until. Circle that in your Bible. You need to know that. By Jesus' death on the cross, God's son shows us the price of freedom. Everything in the Old Testament was building up to this reality. And when we got to the New Testament, when we get to the New Covenant, we realize that Jesus fulfills the law of Moses. Verse 19 says, and I'm going to read it out of the NIV because I want you to see something here. The NIV says, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. I want you to see this because who's the seed? Who's the seed that we're talking about in verse 19? You got to look back at verse 16. Look back at verse 16. The answer to this question is in verse 16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his what? Seed. Scripture does not say unto seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. It says to his seed. Look at verse 16. To his seed. That seed is Christ. I want you to notice the very temporary nature of the law. It was given until something else would come. And that something else was actually someone else. The Mosaic law with all of its ceremonies, all of its rituals and its priesthood and its sacrifices and all of that was given until Christ came. It was all a shadow pointing to Jesus. Colossians 2 and 17. Everything in the law was shouting, look to Christ. Look to Christ. And Paul says in Romans 10, 4, write this down. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. 
Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Jesus came to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. And in doing so, he obeyed the law for you, for me, for all of us. He fulfilled it. He obeyed it perfectly because we can't. Jesus shows us that the law is good. He fulfilled it completely. Jesus alone has a righteousness that is sufficient before God. There's no other religious teacher, nowhere in the Bible or any other religion can a person claim a righteousness of their own merit before God, only Jesus. I don't care where you look. I don't care what you read. There's no other space. There's no other place. There's no other religion. The righteousness can only come through Jesus. Obeying the law on our behalf was the utterly crucial aspect of Christ's work for our salvation. But there's more. I want you to look at verse 13 and 14. Look at it for yourself. There's more. Say there is more. Put there is more in the chat. There is more. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I want you to look in there, that word redeemed, circle it, circle it in your Bible. The word redeemed was sometimes used in Paul's day to describe the purchase of a slave in order to set him free. You know, slavery is a great picture of a man outside of Christ. You're enslaved outside of Christ. You know, we sit in chains, we're chained by sin, we're cursed beneath the law, condemned before God forever, and there's absolutely nothing in and of yourself that you can do about it. But then, I love a but in the Bible, but then we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, perfectly righteous, no condemnation, and he says, I will take the curse for you. I will take the curse for you. Look at verse 13. Herein lies the beauty of the words for us. Look at verse 13. Circle it for us. Two of the most beautiful words in all of scripture. Christ, become, listen, he became a curse instead of us. For us, look at that. He did that for us. He did this instead of us. He was hung on a tree, cursed by God for us. He shed his blood and endured God's wrath and condemnation for us. Look at verse 13. The law drives us to our faces to say with Paul, Based on Romans 7, 24 and 25, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this dying body. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at verse 13, that for us, he did it for us. He did it for us. This is the summit to which the Mosaic covenant points. The crucifixion of Christ where he takes the curse of the law upon himself. He took it on for us. We're almost done. I know this is a lot, a lot of chewing, swallow and digest, swallow and digest. I need you to hear this. Jesus completes the promise to Abraham. He fulfills the promise to, to Moses. He completes the promise to Abraham. Now, Christ's work on the cross takes us back further to God dealing with Abraham. You know, as one from Abraham's line, Jesus completes the promise to Abraham. Look at Galatians 3. I want you to see verse 16 and verse 19. Jesus is the seed to which the promise pointed. Christ perfectly lived the life of faith that is described in scripture. He died so that the blessing of God will be made known in all nations. Think back to Genesis 12 and 3. He, he completes it. Through trusting in Christ, we become children of Abraham. We become the people of God. Abraham was pointing us to Christ. This is why Jesus said, your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. That's John 8 and 56. I was having a conversation with Maya last week talking about Abraham and just all these promises and just all this stuff and all these pieces. He, he saw he saw, talking about Moses and all the promises, they saw these fathers, they saw, they fulfilled, they completed. This is such an important information. These statements are so important. Let me tell you why. 
Abraham was justified by faith in the promise of God. And that promise ever since the beginning was pointing to Christ. Everything pointed to Christ. The only way to come to God is through Christ and Christ alone. You know, Abraham and every other saved person in the Old Testament had faith that was pointing to Christ. Everything pointed to Jesus. You know, due to the progressive nature of God's revelation, these Old Testament saints may not have realized all the details about what God was doing and going to do in Christ, but their faith was in the gospel. Their faith was in the promised seed. Their faith wasn't in their works. Their faith wasn't in their doing. Their faith was in the promised seed to come. This brings us back to Acts and Romans, and we've been talking about it for months now. By grace alone, God gives salvation to us. By grace alone, God gives salvation to us. You know, Paul is continuing to point out in Galatians that they have not done anything to earn God's salvation. They did nothing to become children of Abraham. It was the grace of God that saved him, just like it was the grace of God that saved Paul on the road to Damascus. The same grace, the same grace. God's grace in the gospel is everything. The gospel is not a moral improvement plan. It's not about rule keeping or checking off boxes. It's not about being nice to other people and getting our relationships and our problems fixed here on life so we can have a successful life. The gospel is just not about you just walking through life problem free. That is not the gospel. It's not. The salvation by grace, full and free, was paid for by Jesus. It was paid for us so we can have a relationship with him. And through that relationship, we get the, the benefits and the authority that comes with being kingdom kids. We get that. But there's responsibility on our part. Abraham had a part. Moses had a part. Paul had a part. I got a part. You got a part. We have a part to play in this. We have a part to play in this. You know, by grace alone, God gives salvation to us alone. You know, so... It's available, but it's up to you for the taking. You know, I can lead a horse. I can lead a cow. I can lead whatever to the water, but I can't make them drink. It's up to you. It's up to me to receive it. And if you're asking, how do I receive this? The answer is so in our text. The same way Abraham did through faith alone, we receive God's spirit in us. The same way, faith alone, Abraham did nothing. He was a pagan. He was a sinner. He was lost. He was living far from God. But by faith, he received. And it was credited to him as righteousness. That's the same thing for us. Look at verse 14 in your text. Excuse me. Paul mentions the gift of the Spirit. It's the reminder that the blessings we receive in the new covenant of, in Christ are greater than the blessings of the old covenant. Look at verse 14. Having the Holy Spirit changes everything. As believers, we actually have the living presence of Christ in us. You know, Paul opened up chapter 3, verse 2, by talking about the Spirit. Look at it. It says, Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Later, when we get to chapter five, Paul tells us that those are who are led by the spirit are not under the law. That's Galatians 5, 18. That's a little bit further ahead. But I need you to get this. The theme of freedom from the law in Christ is still prominent near the close of chapter three and verse 25. It's throughout the remainder of Galatians. And we're going to emphasize just how important the gift of the spirit is. And I need you to realize all of this got started. In Romans 8 and 9. All of this goes back when he's talking about the spirit to Romans 8 and 9. This is a lot. I know. It's a lot. I encourage you to take some time this week to read back through it and unpack it. Unpack it. Because if you realize what Jesus did for you. If you understood he fulfilled the law on your behalf. He, be, he took on the curse for you instead of you. Then that should compel us to follow in his footsteps and to be obedient. And I'll be the first to tell you, obedience is not comfortable. 
obedience is not convenient. And a lot of times in being, being obedient means sacrificing yourself. But isn't that what Jesus did for us? Aren't we supposed to pick up our cross and follow after him? Live, live lives in his footsteps? Doing as he did? Reflecting who he is? And allowing our faith to produce a fruit of obedience in our lives? So that we're, we're in this world, we don't look like it? That people see us and the fruit on our trees, on our life trees, Say we are on someone else's team. May our conversations be seasoned with grace and love. May our interactions with people be that re that resembles the Lord. May people look at us and say something different about him. There's something different about her. That's what faith produces. That's what walking with God does. We've become lazy people who profess Christianity as titles, but we don't walk around with towels. We don't walk around with towels of service. We don't walk around with towels of kindness. We don't walk around with towels of obedience, doing what most aren't willing to do. Not because we want to, but because God has chosen us to do so. If we understood Galatians 1, 2, and 3, many of our actions would be different. Many of our responses would be different. You know, walking through the word is not for us to come sit here every Saturday or every Wednesday or whenever you're watching this and just get fat on the word. No, we're supposed to feed on the word and receive it and then go help feed other people. And we feed other people in the way we live our lives. The greatest marketing tool for the gospel of Jesus Christ is a life lived in obedience to the gospel. A life that resembles that of Jesus. Look back over your life. Look back over your week. Look back over yesterday. What on yesterday looked like service unto the Father? What looked like loving people? The Bible says, if you love me, feed my sheep. Did you feed people yesterday words of encouragement? Did you feed people kindness? Did you feed people sincerity? Did you feed people your presence? Did you feed people with prayers? Did you feed people with scriptures? Who did you feed on yesterday? It's not enough to say I love God and not love his people. Our lives should be changing. Every day as we're reading and studying this word, we should be walking into places of fresh conviction. I had a situation yesterday that I didn't want to do. It was inconvenient. And in my flesh, I was mad. But then I had to say, which action is a witness to Jesus? Which action will reflect the glory of the Lord? And after I got myself together and I stopped pouting and fussing in my head, I did because this flesh sometimes cuts up. I went and did all those things that I didn't want to do, handled that situation. And... The last thing the person said to me was only God would have had you do this for me. And I stopped. I'm like, okay. And in that moment, I wasn't trying to be boastful. I said to God, be all the glory. I said, you know, every day I'm trying to be more sensitive to, to Holy Spirit. And when he prompts it in my heart to do something, I try to do it. I don't do it perfectly. I sometimes miss it. I, I sometimes fall short. But today I heard him say, that I could be a witness for him. And the person got out of my car saying, you most certainly did. And I smiled and I thought about, that was me rightly handling the word of truth. I might've missed it some other places, but in that moment of hearing that, it built my faith and it stirred me to listen even more. I don't wanna miss those opportunities to put God on display. I don't want to miss those opportunities to live out the gospel because you are the only Bible that some people are going to read today. You're the only Bible some people are going to read tomorrow. And when they read you, what does it say about your God? I even make it personal. I said, when they read me, am I showing them me or am I showing them thee? Am I showing them me or showing them thee? And sometimes the me answer and the the answer are different. And I have to choose to come in alignment with thee. Your up close and personal questions on the screen. On the screen. What is the relationship between faith and obedience in your life? What does that look like? Is, are you intentional with that? 
You know, in your own words, explain what it means that Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. And I, I put that question in there because I want to want you to identify are any areas in your life where you're still trying to perform. Where you're focusing on your performance instead of the perfection of Jesus. And the last question is, how might Jesus' relationship to these covenants affect the way you read the Old Testament? It's changed everything about how I read and study the Old Testament. Because now when I read, I'm, ex- I'm looking for Jesus. Now that we know he, all of this pointed to Jesus, how does this impact your reading? And I pray that if it hasn't, that it will from this point forward. So, woo! I want you to consider sowing a seed if this has blessed you. If God has ministered to you, if he's taught you, if he's allowed me to be your Bible teacher today, if you show up on Wednesdays or you show up on Saturday because you know I'm going to come teach what God has given me, I invite you to partner with us. I invite you to become a Be Light ambassador. That is how we are supporting our local and global missions. This is how we're supporting giving the gospel out. Because the gospel means we feed people, we house people, we help people, we educate people. So become a, an ambassador. I am encouraging churches. I'm encouraging businesses to partner with us on a monthly basis. You can partner at $25. You can partner at $50. We have people who partner for more. You know your budget. But become a part of this. Become a part of us teaching the raw, unfiltered word of God. I'm not coming with opinion. I am coming with text. And I have one job to teach this Bible. Help us do this. Help us take the seed that you sow and get it into the lives of people. None of this comes to me. None of this comes to me. It goes to Ripple Effects, which is the organization that that, that literally underwrites our community outreach and our, our local missions and ministry. If you don't want to partner, you can just give. There's a QR code on the screen where you can just make a donation for the work that we do. If partnership is not in your heart, but sowing is, or you desire to sow a certain seed, we we have someone who faithfully sows a $7 seed every Saturday, and that blesses my heart. Every time I see that seven come in on Cash App, when I see that report, it blesses me because I know who it is, and I know why they're doing it. So whatever the Lord puts on your heart, I believe when we do what we can, God multiplies it, and we're able to do what he wants us to do with it. So how little or how great, everything is appreciated. You can give by Cash App, or you can give by PayPal. Um, that's on the screen as well. If you want to jump into the Zoom room, we're about to have some deep conversation. I can only imagine us climbing back over these mountain peaks. The meeting ID and the password is on the screen. Anyone is welcome to join us as we talk through this and close out in prayer. If you have any special prayer request, any special prayer requests, drop it in the chat. We make sure we include those as we close out that time together. On next Saturday, we're going to be talking about free as sons. And we're going to be looking at Romans 3, 26 through chapter 4 and 7. And I invite you to read ahead. I invite you to to study because that's rich word and it is going to impact and change your life. So I thank you for tuning in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for guiding us on this this, adventure over these mountain peaks. As we looked at Abraham and we looked at Moses and we looked at Christ. God, we thank you for being our teacher. God, we thank you for bringing all the pieces together for us to understand that you, Jesus, completed the covenant with with Abraham and you fulfilled the covenant with Moses. And because of that, we have Jesus and we are able to, to receive and partake of all that you are. We can live lives with our sin debt marked paid in full where we can come before you, God, in perfect righteousness because of the blood of Jesus. And for that, we thank you. God, we ask that you continue to be our teacher. Holy Spirit, be our tutor. As we're walking through Galatians, we're learning so much and we don't take it for granted. Thank you for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear your word and hearts to receive it. Hands that'll be put on a plow and feet that'll walk it out because it's not enough to know it. God, our prayers for our lives to show it. It's like you're taking us through seminary. And God, we're grateful. We're grateful that you are illuminating your word to us in such a way that we can live it. For that, we are so grateful. We're grateful for you, God, for Jesus. He paid the ultimate price. A price we couldn't pay for ourselves. He he did what we couldn't do so that we could be in relationship with you. Not for religion, 
but relationship. That we could come before you and cry, Abba, Father. For that, God, we thank you. God, search our hearts right now and our minds and our lives for anything in there that's not like you. God, convict us. We learned last week that justification and condemnation are polar opposites, but conviction is something that happens when you dwell on the inside of us. So God, convict us of ways that are not like you. Convicting of thinking that's contrary to you. Convict us of habits that point in the opposite direction of you. God, search our hearts. Are there people we need to, that we need to forgive? Help us in this moment to forgive. God, are we living offended? Lord, help us to, to be bold enough to throw that offense to the foot of the cross. And that we leave it there. God, if there's healing that we need in our bodies, we're reminded in this moment that you are the great physician. You're the God that healeth thee. So God, we thank you for our healing. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your promises. God, we thank you for your faithfulness towards us. And Lord, it is our prayer that as we go into our week, that we go being light carriers, that we go understanding we have a responsibility and an obligation to show the world of our, the, the faith that we have in you and the grace that's available to them. So season our conversations with love. Season our actions with love. Season our lives with love. And God, may your light shine in us, through us, and for us, and illuminate our path as we move forward in you. God, here's what we know if we don't know anything. We cannot do this apart from you. We cannot please you apart from Jesus. We can't. And so, God, we're so humble and we're so grateful that we don't have to. But we believe, we receive, and just like Abraham, everything that we need in you has been credited to our accounts as righteousness because of our faith. So, God, we thank you. For giving every single one of us the measure of faith that we need. But God, we pray that you continue to stretch that faith. So that we can live in such a way that you are on display. We want the world to see you through us. As we live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. Because your grace, it is sufficient. And for that, God, we say hallelujah. We say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To God be all the glory. Thank you for hanging in there with us this week. I look forward to our time of study on next week. And until then, I just want to challenge you to do you on max in Jesus. God bless you.